Why do stars twinkle? How is it that traffic lights know we're waiting? Why is it that rain brings thunder? Like most of you, I drove my parents crazy when I was a kid. <laughs> I was very curious and pretty much a rapid-fire machine gun of questions. And I soon found that science had the answers. That was the real beginning of my love for science. That could provide me with logical, concrete explanations to my wonderings. However, as I grew older, I realized science doesn't have all the answers. In fact, it is far from it. There's an entire field of research devoted to answering questions that we haven't answered before. And that really appealed to me. I thought it would be the coolest thing in the world to discover something that nobody else has ever found. Research also has impact. A single discovery, may it be a better prosthetic or a more efficient form of transportation, that can change the world. It can change the lives of millions. And so I was 15, and I really wanted to do research. At this age, I had only competed in math and science competitions, which tests knowledge of existing science, and wanted to do something new, something that hadn't been studied before. And so I started contacting different uh, labs and was very interested in the work of Dr. Gunsheng Feng. So I told him what I thought about his work and, well, my ideas regarding it, and was accepted to his lab. And I spent the next year learning the ropes of research and doing some work on pancreatic cancer. At this point, however, I wanted to do something new. I wanted to start my own independent interdisciplinary research project, a much bigger undertaking. So my idea took root during the 2009 swine flu pandemic. And, well, it caught my eye because it might not for so many others. Many of us just assume flu is a benign virus. Oh, it's a vaccine every year. Oh, it's just a few days sick in bed. But I, it was then that I realized that flu can kill a lot of people. Since then, I've seen flu pop up on the news again and again. And, uh, well, I was concerned. <laughs> the situation kept getting worse and worse. So my thought process was this. Computers are getting more and more powerful and doing so incredibly quickly. What used to take a room to house can now be beaten by something that fits easily in the palm of your hand. Why can't we use this vast computational power now available in order to speed up the drug discovery process and find new flu medicine? However, in order to do this, I would need not one but two university labs. And so I also contacted Dr. Romy Amaro, who also granted me permission to work in her lab. Now, you have to realize that for these professors, it's an investment to have a high school student. They don't have lots of spare time, money, resources to have you. However, they love seeing young, eager scientists. If you can come across as a critical thinker, someone who is truly interested in their work and will be worth the investment, they'll be only too happy to have you. But back to the flu. Currently, there are highly lethal flu strains that are very close to human-to-human -human transmission. For some, a single mutation might be all that's separating us from a pandemic. And that's really serious. Because, well, almost a century ago, we had the 1918 Spanish flu, one of the worst pandemics in history. It killed about 40 million people. If you compare that to the military deaths of notable wars, that's more deaths, military deaths, or more deaths from the flu than military deaths from the Revolutionary War, Civil War, World War I, World War II, all combined. And a catastrophe like this could happen again. Vaccines take several months to develop a time window in which millions of people could be dying, and the current antiviral drugs are losing their effectiveness due to resistant flu strains. So there's this urgent need for new anti-flu medicine to hold back the pandemic wave while vaccines are being developed. So now that I had access to the labs that I needed, I began my work. I decided to target a protein called the influenza endonuclease. It's a, yeah, it's a protein of the flu virus that is critical for its replication. If I could block this protein, fit a kind of key into the lock and render it useless, I could essentially kill the virus. And so now I'm faced with this incredibly complex problem of finding new potential flu medicine and hoping to use computational approach to simplifying it. Of course, I'm about to run into some major problems. And so um, I was new to the field, and because of that, I spent much of my time staring at these computer errors and looking for a command I may have misused or misspelled. We all know how it is to get computer errors, right? And I was literally spending hours deadlocked. Even after I got more comfortable with the field, I have plenty of obstacles to face. The endonuclease has these two little metal ions in the active site, and computer, uh, computer programs are generally very inaccurate in dealing with these highly charged metals. Because of that, I had to modify a lot of programs to get them to work. And even after all the error pop-ups relented, I had to throw out some of my results because they were just wrong. 
I initially wanted to do what is called molecular docking. And in this, you have a library of compounds, analogous to keys, and you want to fit them into the protein or lock. Each of these keys is then fit into the lock, and based on how well the computer thinks they fit, are scored and ranked. The top ranked compounds are then selected as most likely to work. However, the problem was, was that the manganese ions would screw up the docking scoring functions. And because of that, I couldn't use this. I was blocked. And so um, I took a step back and f trying to find a way around this seemingly dead end. I consulted postdocs and professors and poured over research papers and came across what are called pharmacophore models. So the idea behind pharmacophore models is this. You have several keys or inhibitors that you know fit into the protein or lock even if they don't fit especially well. The program can then find the key characteristics among these inhibitors, shared, um, shared similarities between them that might be the reason why they work at all. And these are put into a three-dimensional model. This model can then be used to find compounds that also have these characteristics. It might fit even better than the original compounds. And what's especially great about this is that I can avoid the troublesome metal ions altogether. So using this model, I quickly screened through a compound library of almost half a million compounds and reduced it to the top 237. These I brought to the biology lab to see if what the computer said would likely to work would actually work. And from that, I found six new influenza inhibitors with good potential to be developed into new flu medicine. These I am pursuing, and I'm talking with pharmaceutical companies about developing further. The approach I took also saves time and effort over conventional methods, which would use machines and a whole lot of chemicals to literally test every single one of those half million compounds. Finding these inhibitors is a bit like finding a needle in a haystack. And using these computational approaches can first reduce the haystack into just a handful. So winning giant Lego trophies is great, but I also learned a lot of important lessons along the way. I saw the power of interdisciplinary approaches. I was faced with a biological question, but used a computer-aided approach into answering it. In my case, technology provided huge labor and time savings, by virtually testing samples rather than actually having to do it. The roots of innovation come from outside of a single field. And it's all about bringing a new strategy to an old problem. I've learned not to idolize people. Well, high achievers are there not to show off their work as unachievable, but rather to be models, be peers, something within reach of all of us. When I began, I actually had no idea if I would get anywhere at all. And I, too, was first daunted by the professor's figures in lab coats. But I soon, saw to, I soon got to see the human behind the lab coat, to see that they are normal people as well. Finally, be open-minded, be inquisitive. What are the questions that you have that are unanswered? How will you go about answering them? Don't take these things for granted. When I was at the Google Science Fair finalist event, it was during the public viewing day, and I was presenting my work, and I overheard these two teenage boys in the background, and they were joking around, and they said something like, ha, huh, who's ever going to die from the flu? That one made me smile. <laughs> Thank you.